In today's episode, we take a look at a kidnap gang who over four jobs netted £250,000. They held a manager of a Tesco supermarket family hostage while he was forced to enter the safe and meet at a rendezvous. The gang's leader was an ex-German paratrooper and mercenary who had done previous robberies in the UK with outstanding successes. A very cool, calm, well-dressed and menacing man. The first part we look at is the crime watch reconstruction and the second part will be the police investigation and the shocking revelation of the gang's leader. After the police investigation, there will be another crime watch episode of another robbery the gang was involved with. remember a couple of months ago about a family held at gunpoint and then kidnapped in a bid to steal money from a major supermarket. It was a particularly distasteful crime. You can imagine the effect that it had on the family concerned. And it's a type of offence detectives are determined to put a stop to. Indeed, with your help tonight, this is one that they're going to solve. In the next few minutes, we'll be revealing for the first time a number of important clues, some of them so specific that several people watching are likely to know who the culprits are. Please call us if you can help. The reconstruction begins four miles northeast of Ipswich. On the afternoon of Friday, August the 2nd, Edna Andrews and her sons Matthew and James were 27 miles from home, walking wearily towards the village of Balaam in Suffolk. They stopped off at a builder's merchant's. We've been kidnapped. Can you get the police? What? What's your problem? Look, these are the marks where we were tied up and held in a car. My husband's the manager at Tesco's. They told him to go and get some money. I don't know where he is. Get the police, please. Hello. This is Mr Andrews, general manager at Tesco's Ipswich. I've just been involved in a serious incident. My wife and family have been taken hostage. Mr Andrews? Yes, sir, we are in touch with your family, and my understanding is that they're safe and unharmed. Oh, thank God. In the investigation that followed, police received four crucial tip-offs. They led detectives to a number of local people whom they believe played minor roles in helping to set up the crime. All denied they know the identity of the actual kidnappers, but from what they have divulged, and from what police have learned from other witnesses, investigators have been able to build up quite a detailed picture of the three men they're now looking for, the ringleaders. We believe the gang are from London and the home counties. What uh, they did was in fact plan the robbery for about six months, travelling to Colchester and Ipswich on odd days and followed Mr Andrews, keeping him under observation. It may also be that during this time they watched and observed other members of Tesco's staff. One of the gang we know was driving a Land Cruiser, a Toyota Land Cruiser, together with a silver Peugeot GTI. It is also known that they followed them to his home address and also kept his family under observation some considerable time. It's clear that this was a well-organised and well-planned robbery conducted by very professional men who are very ruthless in their actions. It's nine o'clock in the evening of Thursday, August the 1st, in Brooks Hall Road in Ipswich. The car had been stolen ten days earlier and now has false number plates. About 20 minutes drive away is Chits Hill in Colchester. Tonight's main headline again. Israel has said yes. See you in a minute. Yeah, okay. And said tonight that the US had agreed to its demands on Palestinian representation. There'll be more on Newsnight on BBC Two at half. Move in and shut up. Who are you? What do you want? I said move in and shut up. Mom! Oh, God. What's going Leave on? Leave him alone, he's Leave a boy. Quiet, and you'll be all right. Move into that room. Keep your heads down. 6-4. 
Everything's okay. We're in. Is it quiet out there? The nose you might be looking out the window, but otherwise it's quiet. Are you expecting anyone tonight? No. Only my son, Matthew. At what time will he be back? Keep your eyes down! Don't look at me. This man is the brains and the leader of the gang. He spoke with a European accent, possibly Dutch or German. We believe he lives in a flat in the London area, possibly alone. He certainly doesn't appear to be married, although he speaks regularly of visiting his nieces and nephews in that area. We believe he's a dog owner and a keen mountaineer. We think that he may be called Paul, but we're far from certain of that. There's no doubt that their guns were loaded. By midnight, a third intruder was in the house and the Andrews' eldest son had returned home to be greeted by the gunman. We know everything about you. Your car, your movements. What we want is £80,000 from your store. We probably don't have that kind of money at the store. Then you have a problem. How much will there be? Probably about 20000 but that's no good to us. We spent ten grand setting this job up. Twenty grand is nothing. Look, I know what you want, and I'll do what you want, only just don't harm my family. Look, it's nothing personal, just a job. I've got a mortgage like you. Cooperate, fine. If not, we'll do your wife and kids. You may find the bodies, you may not. This is a particularly evil and aggressive man. He threatened to rape Mrs Andrews during this incident. We believe him to be married or living with a partner. He drives a red XR3i and pretends to be a builder. He carries a bag of cement in the back of the car for this purpose, to dust himself down with his clothing. It's 5.30 in the morning. You will carry on as normal. Tell someone at the store if you have to, to get the money, but don't tell head office or the police. You will be at the drop-off point at half past three. If you're not there, you can kiss goodbye to your family. Have you got that? They headed north along the A12 towards Ipswich and drove right past the supermarket which Andy Andrews runs. A few miles further on, the car turned into Balaam Woods. About one hour later, at around seven o'clock, Andy Andrews arrived for work as usual. At Balaam Woods, just one of the kidnappers remained, camouflaging the car to prevent it being seen from the road. Very stupid. We know less about this man than the other two. He seems less sure of himself and was regularly ordered about by the other two. We believe he lives in the London area and has spent time in Hollisley Bay Detention Centre in Suffolk for car crime. It's now five past three at Tesco's. Andy Andrews has told some half a dozen staff about what's happened and they've agreed to let him have the takings. A security guard has volunteered to accompany him to give him some support as he heads off to drop the cash, precisely as he's been instructed. They left the car and money in the do-it-all car park off Ranella Road and walked to Ipswich Railway Station, where Andy had been told he'd hear about his family. When no message came, he telephoned the police. Malcolm Hargreaves, obviously we haven't shown much of what happened inside the house, but this was a particularly unpleasant bunch of people. Yes, short of murder or rape, 
I believe this is the most obnoxious offence that criminals can commit, and most villains wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. The first guy, the one who was mid-European, possibly German, you're not entirely sure about this video fit? No, we're not entirely sure. It's the impression of one particular witness, and there may be variations to the hairstyle and the overall shape of the face. Let's just remind ourselves of what the others uh, look like. We think these are fairly accurate. There is, incidentally, a very substantial reward on this. There is indeed. Tesco's have put forward a £30,000 reward, which is on offer for the arrest and charging of the persons responsible. That's most unusual. It's for the arrest and charge. You don't need to secure a conviction. No, we don't. They're obviously really determined that these uh, guys are going to be found tonight. Another good clue, of course, is the Toyota Land Cruiser that uh, you know one of them had. We believe this is an excellent clue. As mentioned in the film, the German we refer to as the German was believed to be using a Land Cruiser type vehicle from January to about July and also a Peugeot Color Silver 205 GTI. Not necessarily a Toyota Land Cruiser, but that's the best description you've got. That's that right? the nearest we can get to it. it may... And I think you reckon he probably disposed of the, of the vehicle around the time of the, of the crime. He probably disposed of the four-wheel drive vehicle about the first week in July. So somebody who's a dealer, perhaps, It's might just possible that a this. garage will remember a German selling that vehicle to them. This was one of the shotguns used in the offence, recovered soon afterwards. Tell us about it. What's, what sort of... It's got a, a, a number on it, B10870. B10870. This is one of two shotguns brought by the criminals to be used on the offence, recovered at Ipswich, and we were only able to find the original owner in South Wales in 1984, and since then, we've not been able to trace its history at all. OK. This belt, cartridge belt, also fun. These uh, aren't the original cartridges that were found with the belt, they were quite unusual. They were of different colours. Yes. It was particularly noticed by the witnesses that there were multicoloured cartridges in the belt. But that is the original belt. Mr Hargreaves, this sort of offence is very unusual. As you say, it's very serious and the police are determined that it shouldn't be repeated. If it is, what is the advice to somebody who finds that their family is, is threatened? Should our, they call the police? What should they do? Our advice is always to notify the police because the villains rely on the overwhelming threats to intimidate these people. We have contingency plans to deal with these matters, and one of the most important aspects is the police will do nothing to place the life of a victim at risk. So call the police however strong the intimidation How and threats are. However strong the intimidation is, that is what they rely on. It's mainly bluff. It's a big reward, as I say. It was a particularly distasteful crime. Here's the number if you can help, 081-811-8181. Uh, that comes directly here to the studio, or you can call officers directed at Essex Police Headquarters in Chelmsford, 452-120-0245, the code for Chelmsford, 452-120. <laughs> It was a shocking, despicable crime. A shop manager's family held hostage, threatened and not knowing if they had come out of the ordeal alive. The Crime Watch appeal was released in October 1991, but what was not shown at the time was police already had one of the gang in custody and knew who arranged the job, but could not find the members of the gang who committed the kidnap, let alone who they were. So let's go further back before the Crime Watch appeal to the aftermath of the robbery. A few days after the kidnap, a reward was released for information leading to the rest of the subjects involved. It brought every small time crook out of the woodwork. A name came up multiple times, but another informant would go one step further by telling police the same name, Terry Allen. But he would add more to the name. He would tell the police the gun and the gear to do the robbery was still at Terry Allen's house. And in the next few days, his share of the money would come through the mail. Police intercepted the money, £2,000, and delivered it to Terry Allen's address. He was promptly arrested. A gun and cartridge belt was recovered. The exact ones that were shown in the Crime Watch appeal. Terry Allen was held, but soon became apparent to police he was the gopher to the gang. He had no clue who the gang was. The only name he had was John the German. The gang would turn up at his house and he was kept out of the loop. John the German would buy sweets and toys for Terry Allen's kids. But Terry Allen was absolutely terrified of the German gang leader. 
Now Terry Allen was an ex-burglar and shoplifter. Very, very small time. He had no standing in the criminal fraternity. He was known to other criminals and police, but he was considered a deadbeat, soft and a bit daft. Getting involved in a kidnapping was way out of his depth. Terry Allen, when questioned by police, went through every detail of what happened. He told the police everything, but had no knowledge of the names. A description of John the German's car, a Toyota Land Cruiser, and details of a Peugeot 205 were released. It turned out that John the German was no longer using it, so a search was put out to find the 4x4. The man who had the original plan for the robbery, local villain Jack Marsh, was arrested but he said he had no knowledge. He was charged and remanded into custody. After the crime watch appeal, a car dealer called the police saying he was sold the very same car. Though it was not a Toyota Land Cruiser, but it was in fact a Mitsubishi Shogun police were looking for, though the car had been sold on. He provided police with a name and address. John the German's name was Carl Schultz. Police raided the address on the V5, but it was the home of Schultz's ex-girlfriend. Crime Watch received a call from an ex-girlfriend, Lorna Burns. It also turns out that Lorna's sister phoned Crime Watch also, saying the resemblance matched her sister's ex-boyfriend and gave the same name. It turned out Schultz had already left the area, breaking up with Lorna. He borrowed £500 due to what he said was a work problem. Lorna Burns knew nothing of Carl Schultz's life of crime and under the sink in her home, she found a sawn off pump action shotgun, a disassembled rifle, silencers and ammunition. Lorna was released without charge, having contacted the police after finding the weapons. When asked where her ex-boyfriend would most likely be, she said Carl Schultz would most likely have gone climbing in Wales. Schultz was driving her new car, a white Daihatsu Sport Trap, in a very rare white and chrome combination, a limited edition model. Police began the search in Wales and it wasn't long before police found the Daihatsu. The car was at a local hotel in Kapelkurig in Snowdonia. Police followed Schwartz back into the hotel bar and he was pinned to the ground by officers and he was arrested without a struggle. Schultz shouted, come on you guys, you've been watching too much TV. At the police station he was booked in and he was fingerprinted one of the detectives said to Schwartz about sending the prince to the German police, to which Schwartz replied, what will come back will be very interesting. Police certainly wanted to know more about Carl Schultz, with a Tesco kidnapping and another earlier robbery connected to the German. His arrest sheet will give the idea of who they were dealing with. Schwartz was interviewed and remained silent. He laughed and drew pictures of people in coffins, put the names of his kidnapped victims above each one as police questioned him. In Schultz's belongings was a black pocket diary that had coded name and numbers. Police cracked the code and Sean Wayne and Robert Moore were identified as the two missing members of the gang. With police raiding their houses, they had already gone on the run after Schwartz's arrest. They were aimlessly driving around the estate where they both lived in the same Peugeot 205 from the kidnap. Police blocked in the car and the two men were arrested. Carl Schultz's fingerprints came back with his file, which shot the police. Carl Schultz was in fact John Calton, who was 39 years old. A Yorkshire man who on his arrest sheet said he had a thick Yorkshire accent, who was in prison for several bank holdups over a decade earlier. He was a former British paratrooper. After his release, he adopted the persona of Carl Schultz. Smart, well-dressed, and thought to be inspired by the die-hard film villain Hans Gruber, which he was obsessed with. His mannerisms called persona and pronounced English with a German accent made him look tough, smart and capable. Perhaps the most frequently knocked off scene in Die Hard, I noticed the similarities reading the newspaper reports from the time matched Schultz to the Die Hard villain. In a scene in Die Hard on Nantes County 3, Alan Rickman's Hans Gruber demands the tower's vault codes from Tagagi, or else. If you rewatch the scene, notice how your eyes keep being drawn to Rickman's hands in the scene, as he rather deliberately unscrews the silencer. 
then places the silencer on the table, then places the gun on the table, and then splays out his fingers to hover over the gun, then slowly grasps the gun again, and finally aims the weapon at Takagi. Gruber is giving Takagi a verbal countdown, but he's also performing a countdown with his hands in each of the beats. Ripman is literally mesmerizing, and Takagi looks hypnotized in his terror. John Calton used the same scene to terrorise his prisoners. Detectives could not believe the suspect they had caught and his previous offences were rather flat to say the least. The officers believed he would be a major international criminal figure, but John Calton's new persona had elevated his criminal enterprises. Police were connecting other robberies and kidnaps that had been unsolved. When John Calton was faced with the lie of who he was, he still maintained the German accent and remained silent, only to reply, no comment. A five-week trial ended at Chelmsford Crown Court. Gang leader John Calton, who was 39 years old, who masqueraded as the German, Carl Schultz, aka Hans Schultz, aka John the German, was jailed for 25 years. Accomplices Sean Wayne, who was 24 years old, and Robert Moore is 23 years old. Each received 20 year sentences. All three are denied but were convicted of robbing Tesco manager James Andrews of £55,000 from his store in Cop Dot near Ipswich in 1991 and robbing Barclays Bank in Calverdon two years earlier. They were cleared of other robberies in South London in which families of bank managers were taken. Calton had previous convictions for a series of building society robberies in London, in which he coolly claimed a bomb was strapped to his waist and demanded cash. During the investigation, detectives discovered an army report on Calton, which said paratrooper Calton had no regard for human life and was better suited as a terrorist than a soldier. Following the verdict, Simon Cullen and his family and Mr Andrews agreed to appear at a press conference. As they prepared to get on with their lives, and tried to come to terms with their horrific ordeal. They thanked police for the wonderful job they had done. Mr Cullen's stepfather, Keith Cullen, praised officers for their integrity. Jack Marsh was found guilty of conspiracy in setting up at the Tesco robbery. He was handed a 12-month sentence. The judge accepted that Jack Marsh had no involvement or contact after selling the plan for the job, which was a very thin outline. Terry Allen, who was the first of the gang to be caught, with no knowledge of the other names, but helped the robbery squad detectives with descriptions and where the job originated, was handed a three year sentence. The judge stated that he had cooperated with the police at considerable risk to himself. And that has been taken into account, but he'd done nothing to stop the kidnap and received money from it. Police stated the gang had committed four known robberies with money from those totalling £250,000 being taken. The convictions for the two robberies were disappointing, but the sentences were that high, it wouldn't have added any more to the years served. It's believed Carlton is behind more robberies, how many may never be known. Up next is the Calverdon Bank robbery crime watch reconstruction by the same gang, which police connected after the Tesco robbery. Six months ago, we reconstructed a bank raid that had taken place in Preston. It's a type of crime that's been tried several times, not always successfully. A bank manager was kidnapped, held hostage overnight, and then forced to help a gang steal money from his branch. Last month, there was another attempt, this time at Kelverdon in Essex. But because the victims had seen the Crime Watch film on Preston, they were able to respond with a great deal of coolness and perceptiveness. They noticed a lot of intriguing detail while the gang was in their home, details which might help you identify the robbers. Now, we've changed the family's names in this reconstruction and used actors throughout. The events began on a Monday afternoon in early April when Jonathan Turner, an assistant manager at Barclays Bank in Kelverdon, dropped in to see his boss. Well, I'll see you next week then, Jonathan. Have a good time. He was taking the week off and was handing over his keys. 
Jonathan planned to spend the evening watching TV with his younger brother and his mother. His stepfather was out at a meeting. Is your father in? No, he's not in at the moment. Glad to hear that. Ah! Shut up! Just be quiet. The family was handcuffed together, and the smartly dressed man deliberately loaded his gun in front of them. Where do you work? At Barclays Bank in Kelverdon. Yes. But I haven't got the keys. I'm on holiday. You what? I'm on holiday. I've handed the keys over. At that point, their stepfather came home. He'd been at a meeting of the local archaeological society. What? Go over there and sit down. What the hell's going on here? Where are your car keys? In my pocket. The robber in the dark jersey took the family's Peugeot. The family keep a precise record of their mileage for business claims, so we know the robber travelled 9.4 miles. But where? Meanwhile, the family was taking care to observe details about the gunman. They noticed that he strutted, and by measuring his height against objects in the room, we know he was over six feet tall. They spent the night on the sofa with the duvet cover. Two accomplices returned with the other robber in the Peugeot and sat behind them. Got any gangster movies? While the real-life gangsters made themselves at home, Jonathan was taken to the dining room and questioned on three occasions. On the first, he noticed the gunman was smoking John Player specials. Now, I want you to draw me a picture of the inside of the bank and get it right. I want to know who has the keys when you're on holiday. Stephanie Walker. Good. Look at me. Would you recognise me? I don't think so. We're going to put Stephen in the back of the car and we're all going to go to the bank. You got that? Sit down. Back to the radiator. Make yourself comfortable. You're going to be there for a while. The robbers took Jonathan's car and he was made to follow in his father's. Jonathan was unused to driving his father's car and at the junction of Station Road and Kelverton High Street, he over-revved it. He's sure that he attracted the attention of the two women at the bus stop. They've not so far been traced. They drove into the doctor's car park where the bank staff usually leave their cars for work. After 20 minutes, the bank manager arrived. Please, Mr. Edwards, do as they say. They've got my family. My brother's in the back of that car. What? All right, Jonathan, we'll do exactly as they say. Straight into your office and turn off the alarm. In the manager's office, they waited for the holder of the other set of keys. They were soon joined by another member of the gang. So, is this your first robbery? No. How about you? Don't ask me questions like that. As the staff arrived, they were locked inside a storeroom. By now, Stephen had been in the boot for two hours. Be all right, mate. Won't be long now. 
Both of you. Over here. Two hundred yards from the bank, the robbers collected their colleagues and sped off in the dark blue Peugeot. In the Astra, the robbers had left the radio on. The Peugeot went three and a half miles to Whitham and was abandoned at the car park of Wimpy Holmes on the Crittle Road Industrial Estate. Did you see where they went next? Mike Ainsley, robber number one in particular was trying to lay an awful lot of uh, false clues. He was speaking a variety of accents, maybe speaking Gaelic or Greek, I gather, and you think he was wearing a disguise when he, he lifted the balaclava? Yes, I do. He provoked uh, the victim into looking at his face, and I believe the intention was to draw attention to false scars under his eyes. OK, now we have a video fit of him with this sort of dark tan, Mediterranean appearance, uh, almost Asian, as, as one of the witnesses put it. But we can bleach that and remove the scarring from under his eyes, and that's what he might look like. Robber number two equally seemed of uh, dark complexion, but that could have been, could have been makeup, you think? Again, yes, that could have been disguise. OK, and uh, the sc scarring, uh, he had, show us the sort of scar he had on his yes. cheek. He had a T-shaped scar on the left cheek, okay. but again, I believe that to be a false scar. OK, now robber number three, we've got an e-fit uh, of that, fairly distinctive man. One of the, 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 the men, the gunman incident, it was called Phil, and either this man or the fourth was called Ken at one point. You that, think yes. those might be their real names? Yes, I do. Two cars were seen outside the bank, uh, a red Cortina, uh, and another car in front of that. Just tell us about that yes, briefly. The red Cortina, <coughs> and behind it was a bronze or gold coloured Mercedes. So in front of, the, yeah, the red Cortina yes. was behind the, That's the monarch. Right. The Mercedes was seen somewhere else as well, uh, around where the families lived. Well, in fact, lived. the significance of, the, of this car is that um, <coughs> two men were seen going to that car on the morning outside the bank, one a ginger-haired man and one a man of Asian appearance. But we have also had sightings of similar cars in the area of the victim's home over, and a, a, sorry, over a uh, period of weeks before the offence. OK, and a white Cortina, or what seemed like a white Cortina, was also seen near the victim's home, but this was some time before the robbery. Yes, it was. <clears throat> that was the uh, 13th of February when the younger son of the home was at home and saw this car outside with a man sitting in the car behind the wheel. He now realises that the man he saw on that occasion was the number one man. OK. There are a lot of other clues there. We want those two women who were at the bus stop to come forward. Incidentally, we don't know if one of them was wearing yellow scarf as in the reconstruction. We don't know what they were wearing. But if you were there 7.30 in the morning, Tuesday the 4th, do let us know. The gun was loaded yes, and uh, obviously the police are desperate <coughs> to get these people. There's a substantial or £25,000 reward put up by Barker's Bank for this. If you can help, there's the number. If you prefer, you can call the incident room in Essex on 0245 452 120.